But I should start off, I guess, by saying how pleased I am to have this opportunity to address you. Um, I'm still quite new to the role of Chief Executive. I joined in February. And, and I've already learnt a lot about the vital job being done by insolvency practitioners in the field of rescue and recovery. I must say I've been made to feel very welcome, um, including by some of you in the audience today. Um, so thank you for that. And as I've already said, the theme for this presentation is change. Um, as you'll know, I've had no problem in pulling together some material to talk about changes. On a personal note, I came to the insolvency service from Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service. There I was the Director of Strategy and Change, and my recent background has been very much focused around major project and programme management. And the success or failure of major programmes, I think, hangs not often on the technical details and precisely what you're doing, but our ability to manage human relationships well. Um, I think that's the real key to our ability to manage change well. The service itself is currently engaged on a number of projects, um, looking to improve the way that we operate our services, improve customer service, and also become more efficient um, and, and conscious of the cost to running our operation. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. I'm highly conscious that following the passing of legislation recently impacting on the insolvency regime, we now face a major challenge in implementing the changes that we've introduced. And I'm very well aware from possibly some hard experiences down the years that uh, passing legislation is quite easy. Implementing the changes that result from that is the real challenge. And the difficult job in implementing those changes well, ensuring not only that it's, it's good for us, but it's good for those that also have to interact for the system, works for you, works for your businesses. Um, I have a number of priorities for the insolvency service. Firstly, we need to ensure that we're on a financially stable footing. As with all organisations, we need to know that our income is going to be sufficient to enable us to carry out the duties for which we have responsibility. Um, an insolvent insolvency service is a headline I'm keen to avoid. Uh, and much depends on finding a reasonable solution to the issue of how to fund our handling of those insolvency cases where there are no assets. Another priority for me is I want to ensure that we maintain and improve our performance. I want to develop a culture of continuous improvement where the frontline staff themselves take the role of suggesting and implementing efficiencies in the way we work. At best, continuous improvement leads to better motivated staff delivering better services more efficiently. It can be a real example of positive change. We have, for example, recently run an exercise in Plymouth in the Debt Relief Order Unit, which has successfully engaged staff in introdu introducing system improvements which they themselves identified. They've come up with a number of suggested changes, each relatively small in itself, but which cumulatively have meant that both cost savings and improvement for customers. For example, just to show you the, the nature really of sort of small process change, one of those involved the creation of a standard response to debtors seeking information about the end of their DRO moratorium period. In the past, um, every time somebody made contact with us, we wrote them an individual letter explaining what happened next. Um, now, a system-generated response is sent, ensuring that swift and accurate information is given. It improves the customer experience. And because of the number of inquiries of this type we were receiving, we estimate that literally hundreds of hours of staff time have been saved. And as we're trying to keep the cost of DROs affordable for those needing access to that form of debt relief, all savings are really welcome and actually very important to us. This is an example of the kind of cost reduction and service improvement not being something which has to fight each other, but something that you can actually do both at the same time. Another benefit of the continuous improvement process lies in increased staff engagement levels that nearly always results. All the research suggests that staff who are, in, who are engaged in the aims of the business are more fulfilled personally, contribute more to the organisation, and so there really is a win-win situation. And in talking of our people, I suppose 
that takes me really to my third priority. I'm really keen to encourage their development. In my short time in the service, I've seen that we have some incredibly knowledgeable and dedicated people um, and doing what is a very technical job. But we need to ensure that we provide them with a career path and we need to use that to help us recruit, retain and motivate the best. Um, it, it would be no secret uh, either to those of you in the audience who are from the insolvency service or to any of the rest of you who have met us that we, we certainly have an ageing workforce um, and we just need to think about what happens next and what the next generation looks like and how we encourage more people in and bring them through. Um, sometimes people look forward to an imagined future where change is at an end. As the presentation we've just seen, I think, makes completely clear, it really never will be. And I think, actually, that if you think about it, change has always been present. It's just that when any specific change is over and done with and it's in the past, Sometimes we forget the pain that was gone through then in introduction and we look back, to, I think, to a mythical past where we didn't have to deal with change like this, but I think we always did. Now, you may be aware that it's the 25th anniversary of the Insolvency Service as an executive agency. There was a considerable change in that period. Uh, case numbers first soared and then plummeted. And our office structure is now much reduced, a process that has been painful at times for the staff, certainly, but as a result, I think we are better placed to deal with rapid fluctuations in the future. And since 1990, the service has adapted, of course, to changing times, most notably, perhaps, in the way in which technology is being used. Many of the stories from staff who've been around for the last 25 years mention the increasing role played by women in the organisation and the changing culture that that's, been brought, uh, that that's brought about as a result. Um, well, hopefully accelerated then by the appointment of me as the first female CEO. Um, and the service really has taken great strides towards truly reflecting the society in which we live. Something else which I think is important that we continue to do that. If you don't understand your customers, if you don't understand the society that you're serving, uh, it's incredibly difficult to provide the right service because you make assumptions about what people want, how they'd like to work with you, that aren't necessarily true. Over that 25-year period, we've taken on additional tasks, including redundancy payment work and work on live company investigations. And in 2009, of course, there was the introduction of debt relief orders, the first new insolvency procedure since the introduction of individual voluntary arrangements in 86. We continue to evolve as an agency in pursuance of the general objective to increase the proportion of contact um, that the government wants to be handled digitally, we are carrying out a major overhaul of the way that the redundancy payment service operates in the future. RPS, as you will know, is responsible for the payment of uh, redundancy amounts to employees who are entitled to redundancy payments where an employer is unable to make that payment. Now, given the significant interaction then with the public, the RPS were chosen as one of the 25 significant digital exemplar services by the Government Digital Service. These exemplar services are expected to pioneer new online services which are simpler, clearer, faster to use and built around the needs of users. It's involved a lot of hard work, but by March this year, both of our redundancy claim forms were available on gov.uk and a high level of voluntary take-up and user satisfaction was achieved. Over the next few months, we intend to gradually withdraw the use of paper forms. And obviously this will affect the insolvency practitioner profession because most people in that situation get their paper forms currently from the IP who's uh, controlling the, uh, the wind of the organisation. Um, it's our aim to achieve 80% digital take-up by the end of the year. And we're also going to be testing our assisted digital support model to learn more about how we can help those who need support to go online. And we'll use our findings to help develop the model for future online services. Whilst on a theme of digital engagement, let me also mention the new role we'll be shortly taking on, that of the adjudicator, as brought in by the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Act 2013. That uh, act has transferred, will transfer to us um, the role from the court 
of making bankruptcy orders in debtor petition cases and our intention there is that we will make that a fully online process so that once the provision is implemented an individual seeking the protection of bankruptcy will follow a new process. They'll complete an online application and submit their application to the newly created Office of Adjudicator rather than to the court. Um, and, and any response they receive and any interaction will also be digitally. As a result of those changes, the court will only become involved in a minority of cases where an individual applies for bankruptcy. And those cases will be ones involving an appeal or a post-order application. And in this way, much valuable court time will be freed up. Benefits for the insolvency service will include automatic case generation and the uploading of data from the application directly to our electronic file systems. For the individual, the changes will mean easier access to bankruptcy and the removal of the need to physically attend uh, court, an experience which many find incredibly stressful. By making the application online, the service will be able to help individuals find information on bankruptcy, debt relief orders and other debt solutions easily and in one place. This will allow an individual to, access, to assess their eligibility and to decide the most suitable debt solution for their circumstances. In addition to introducing new online bankruptcy applications, the service will also upgrade the current online application for debt relief orders. Our investigation work continues to also produce valued outcomes. We secured over 1,200 disqualification orders again last year, and around 40% of the orders obtained were for periods of over five years, and 10% were for periods of over 10 years, showing, I hope, that we don't just tackle lower level conduct. That in the 10 year cases, obviously reserved for the most serious um, of cases. We also wound up over 40 investment scans with analysis showing that these had cost the public over 40 million pounds. Enforcement work has to constantly evolve and change to tackle the new challenges that director behavior throws up. We need constantly to review our priorities to ensure that we are tackling the themes that matter most to the public. We have dealt recently with a number of cases involving breaches of immigration and national minimum wage legislation. Working with the Home Office Immigration Enforcement Team, we have in the last year seen 26 directors and two insolvent individuals across the country banned or restricted for a total of 187 years for employing illegal workers. And further cases are due to be coming before the courts in the coming months. I think it will probably come as no surprise to you, given the uh, concentration by the government on this kind of area, that it's going to be um, an area of wrongdoing where we will be increasingly looking to, to identify misconduct and to take action. We couldn't do this, of course, without the support of insolvency practitioners. It's the reports that you submit that help us to identify cases to take forward, and we very much value the information you provide. This is one good example of the service and the profession working well together to achieve highly creditable outcomes. So that's what we've been doing. And I'm going to turn now to start looking at some of the upcoming changes for the profession. Of course, these are early days for the new government, and it's too early to assess what view the government might take on the insolvency regime. You will have noticed, though, I'm sure, that the new Secretary of State has announced plans for further cuts in red tape during the course of the Parliament, and his aim is to make Britain the best place in Europe to start and to grow a new business. The focus for us at present is on the delivery of measures brought in by the Deregulation Act 2015, and the Small Business, Enterprise and Employment Act 2015. These include the introduction of partial authorization for insolvency practitioners to allow those who want to to specialize in either personal or corporate insolvency. There's also much work to be done to revise the JIEB exam structure before the licenses can be issued. But once introduced, we hope the new structure will encourage competition in the profession by reducing barriers to entry. We understand that there is some interest already being expressed, particularly on the personal insolvency side, on the part of those who are currently studying for the JIEB certificate, and it'll be interesting to see how that develops. 
Work is in progress on implementing changes to the way in which insolvency practitioners seek approval for their fees. In future, it is proposed that IPs will need to give an estimate for the charges that they are likely to incur um, and charge if they are going to charge on a time and rate basis. This is all intended to deal with creditor concerns over fees charged by IPs and follows recommendations made by Professor Kempson following her review of this issue. We recognise that you don't have a crystal ball and that there will be occasions where the estimates turn out to be significantly under or over the eventual amount charged. But there was widespread support for the idea of providing estimates and creditor groups in particular have welcomed the proposal. And such estimates have long been common practice in other, in other professions, for example in the law or indeed in other areas of accountancy. And so although I recognise the particular challenges for insolvency practitioners, I feel that this is one of those changes we will look back on and wonder why we hadn't brought it in much earlier. Change in this area has also been brought about by collaborative working between the service and, profession, and the profession. You told us that the initial proposals would be hard to make work in practice and may have detrimental impact. And ministers did listen to those concerns and adapted the proposals to their current shape. The government has also strengthened the ability of regulators to look at the, the issue of fees by including a reference to fair and reasonable fees in the new regulatory objectives. At the same time, we'll be working with the profession to see if we can find ways to improve the information creditors receive about the cost of insolvency proceedings. It's hoped that a combination of these measures will help but tackle creditor and debtor concerns and help maintain the reputation of the profession. We're also working on the introduction of a variety of red tape challenge measures put forward by the last government. I mentioned the commitment already made by the Secretary of State to reduce red tape, and it really does appear that this government is likely to be just as keen, if not even keener, to reduce burdens on business. Our red tape challenge measures were intended to allow for the streamlining of insolvency procedures, many of which had not been significantly changed for decades, leaving them out of touch with modern working practices. We are looking particularly to encourage the modernising of communications and decision-making pro procedures for insolvency procedures. Many of the changes arose from suggestions put forward by the insolvency profession, and we were very grateful for that help. New legislation also allows us to streamline the process for insolvency practitioners when reporting on director conduct. And we hope in the future to receive information at an earlier stage to allow for prompt targeting of cases for investigation. We do try to ensure that we listen to those who are likely to be impacted by changes that are proposed. And in this area, we've been working closely with the profession to ensure that the changes will work in practice. We're currently looking to implement the new provision on compensation orders, giving courts the power to order redress where a disqualification order is made. This is not a power we expect to use in all disqualification cases. In fact, it will probably only be used in a minority of cases. But it will be a useful extra weapon in the armoury and give real teeth to an enforcement regime. In the main, we will only look to seek compensation orders where IPs themselves have not sought recoveries from the directors. We don't want to introduce an element of double jeopardy, and so again, we'll be working closely with practitioners in the future to ensure that we select the right cases. Away from legislative measures, there are significant developments for the profession arising from the Graham Review of Prepack administrations. At present, creditors will often see a prepack deal as a stitch-up, a way of helping directors keep control of businesses whilst leaving debts behind. And they sometimes point the finger at the insolvency practitioner, who they see as having colluded in the deal. None of that helps the reputation of the profession. Theresa Graham, who I know is talking to you later, herself recognised the value that prepacks could bring for creditors. However, the review did point out some poor practice, particularly around marketing. And as a result, and to implement the review's recommendations, a revised statement of insolvency practice, SIP 16, has been prepared by the Joint Insolvency Committee. It significantly strengthens the requirements around marketing of businesses prior to a prepack deal. 
and work is well underway with valuable ICAEW assistance to set up a pre-packed pool to which proposals can be submitted for an independent view on whether or not the deal represents an appropriate way of proceeding. Once again, I think it's a really good example of one of the key elements of successful change to engage as widely as possible, including with those who are critical of the proposals. It's worth pointing out that the new SIP has been developed by a joint insolvency committee, which now has strong lay representation on the board, including representatives of creditor bodies who have in the past been strongly critical of pre prac procedures. And bringing such bodies onto the JIC has improved transparency and allows for a better dialogue between the insolvency profession and creditor representatives when issues such as pre pac start blowing up. Now, work is also proceeding on revised insolvency rules. The rules haven't been consolidated since they were brought in in 1986. Um, a work in progress set of draft rules was published on the 27th of March, just before Parliament dissolved, and we're continuing to work closely with stakeholders in the service in developing them. These new rules include the procedural rules to support debtor petition reform and rules to codify the administration expense regime to reflect judicial developments. And what about the changing scene for regulators, such as the ICAEW? Well, I've already mentioned that transparency is a key element in improved public perception of the work carried out by the profession. The same holds true of the work done by regulators, and the insolvency service is already working with regulators to bring about improvement there. As part of, our agenda, of that agenda, you'll be interested to hear that the report following our monitoring visit to the ICAEW is expected to be published later this week. The report focuses on key areas such as the monitoring of IP activities and the handling of complaints. Recommendations are made where we feel there's scope for improvement, but broadly, I'm pleased to say that we were encouraged to see changes already being implemented within the ICAEW to improve the robustness, particularly in the area of complaints handling. And we welcome the ICAEW's constructive approach to our new monitoring process, which helped ensure that the report could be published within a reasonable time frame. We're also aware of changes taking place within the ICAEW governance structure and very much welcome the increased emphasis being placed on separation between membership and regulatory functions of the organisation. Criticisms of the current regulatory structure often focus on the difficulty that RPBs face in carrying out both of these roles and the ICAEW moves can only assist in countering such complaints. By publishing these reports for all regulators, not just the ICAEW, we're doing our bit to improve transparency so that those impacted by decisions made by IPs can see that there is a robust system of monitoring in place. For the same reason we have agreed with regulators that sanctions applied to insolvency practitioners will now be placed on our website where hopefully they will be far more accessible to those who are interested. The ICAEW and other regulators will also be impacted by the proposed new regulatory objectives, which were introduced by the Small Business Act. Both ICAEW and the Insolvency Service must have regard to those objectives when carrying out their respective functions in future. And the objectives include a requirement to act in the public interest, to ensure fair treatment for all of those impacted by insolvency processes and to encourage the charging of fair and reasonable fees by insolvency practitioners. The same act introduced new powers for the insolvency service as oversight regulator. And we're not intending or expecting to be regularly handing out fines and reprimands to the RPBs. We do think it gives us a range of proportionate powers similar to those wielded by other regulators. This, we believe, will help increase confidence in regulation generally. As now, we would always expect to resolve issues first by way of constructive dialogue. This is perhaps an unusual change. It is one we would regard as a success if we never actually have to use the new powers. But the current situation is unsustainable, where we might say something is clearly wrong, but we have no power to tackle the issue. And we have taken a power to seek sanction against an individual IP ourselves where we feel it is in the public interest to do so. 
We're not expecting to use this power very frequently either. We want the RPBs to take responsibility for regulating the profession. However, there may be some cases where we take the view that it would be in the public interest to, to pursue a sanction ourselves, perhaps where we have already undertaken some investigation work. We're currently working with the regulators on guidance that will help improve understanding on both sides as to how the new powers will be used. Insolvency practitioners themselves will have a vital role to play to make, sure, uh, to make the life of regulators easier. Compliance with the legislation and SIPs is only part of this responsibility. There is an overall duty to act ethically. The profession is occasionally let down by a small minority, and where this happens, we look to regulators to act swiftly and robustly.